Good morning, everyone. Good morning. The scripture that we're going to be speaking from today is from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. And it reads as follows. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once, they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This morning I would like to speak with you from this subject. Is Jesus calling you? Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Is Jesus calling you? Is there anyone here that feels like they're being called? Amen by Jesus Amen. to do his will for your life? Amen. Just you, Charlie? <laughs> Nobody in? Okay, I see some hands. All right, I'm all right. sorry. See, I took my glasses off and I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't do that. I know I can't have, see? But there are a few people that realize that Jesus is calling you for something. Hopefully today, we will be able to figure out what it is he's calling you to do. It looks like we're going to be talking about fishermen. Any fishermen in here? All right, I see some hands just waiting. I don't, uh, I don't fish anymore. I remember when I got out of the army, I moved into a neighborhood, I bought my first house, and all the men on that block, I think three of them had boats, two of them had motorhomes, and they would go fishing just about every weekend. And finally they invited me. I told them, I said, I don't fish. They say, well, you're gonna love it. So I went fishing with them. We made a few trips and it just seemed easy because we'd go to places and seem like the fish would just be wanting to jump into the boat. We went out there once and the weather was bad. And uh, nobody was catching anything. That whole weekend it was cold. The whole weekend we never, there was one fish caught in two and a half days. And I caught it. Amen. The rookie caught it. That's what they used to call me, the rookie. I caught a fish. Nobody else caught a fish. And I'm like, you guys, you guys told me you've been doing this for a while. What's up? They said, man, that's just luck. I said, no, I got skills. I'm playing the game. I know I hadn't done nothing. It just fish got on my hook. But I never let them forget it. And after that, they were a little hesitant to invite me. But I was so much fun. But anyway, Jesus, he was turning men that fished for fish he wanted to turn them into men that fished for other men. And 
women kind. Come on. That's what he wanted them to do. Come on. They had been out fishing all night. Mm. And as morning broke, the night yielded to day, and the sky turned from black to blue. The first rays of sunshine revealed some hardworking men busily engaged in their occupation. Those men were used to seeing the sun rise over the Sea of Galilee. They were fishermen and their job required them to fish during the cool of the night when the fish were feeding. After a long night of fishing, all that was left was to clean the catch, mend the nets, and sell the fish to those who sold in the markets. It was a hard life, but it put bread on the table. Some of you sound like you know what that's all about. Put the bread on the table. I remember once in my life I had two full-time jobs at the same time, trying to put food on the table. Nobody ever missed a meal. And I thank God for the opportunities that he gave me. He knew what I needed, and he supplied our needs. And I have, I have a witness. I have a witness in the room. Amen. She's been with me uh -oh. for going on 51 years. Whoa. And she knows how hard I worked. That's why I don't like getting up off the couch now. <laughs> but I did it, didn't I? Thanks Amen. to the Lord, I was able to do it. As they were fishing their work, finishing their work for the night so they could go home and rest their weary bodies, a man that they all knew passed by on the shore. He spoke just a few words to them, but what they heard would forever change the course of their lives. And as a matter of fact, they changed our lives over 2,000 years later. These same men have changed our lives. Do you agree with that? That they may have that may have been the scene when Jesus passed by the boats where Peter, Andrew, James, and John were working. His call to those four men forever changed our lives. The public ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ is just commencing. That's when it was beginning. One of his first acts is to choose some men to assist him in his work. He was calling ordinary men to do the extraordinary work of God. And he is still calling people to come to receive salvation today. He is calling them to come for service. He is calling. Our text reveals something about this matter of the Lord's call. This passage reveals several characteristics in these verses concerning the call of the Lord. One thing you should know is that the gifts and the callings of the Lord are irrevocable. Did you know that? Come on. Come on. He's not going to take it back. Come on. I'm standing here today because he wouldn't, he wouldn't uh, revoke the calling that I avoided uh -huh. for approximately 30 years. My God. Come on. Come on. Come on. I'm just, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, as long as I'm here, I'm going to tell you the truth. There's no way I'm supposed to be beginning my ministry at the age of 70. <laughs> That's what happened. Show now. But that's not when he called me. Well, he's real, huh? Is he calling you? Come on. How long have, has he been calling you? Come on. And you haven't answered. Do you know that you will never get a more important call? That's good. You never will. Come on. I don't care how long you live. You're not going to, I don't know what you're waiting on, but it's not going to happen. 
There are several characteristics of these calls, and I'm going to try to go over them. Number one, his call is personal. This is seen in the fact that he walked up to those boats and called those four men specifically. Other boats were anchored on the Sea of Galilee that morning, but he called four specific men in those two specific boats. He called them personally. So it is with us. The call of the Lord is an intensely personal matter. He calls us. He deals with us. He does so one-on-one. -on -one. When Jesus called them, he found them working. Mm -hmm. Peter and Andrew were casting their net. John and James are mending theirs. It seems that his call to them fit perfectly with their personalities. For instance, Peter and Andrew were always casting the gospel net. They were either preaching fiery sermons or they were bringing people to Jesus. They were casting that net. They were busy with evan evangelism. On the other hand, James and John spent time mending the gospel net to ensure that the fish did not swim away. Their main emphasis seemed to be the progression and growth of the church and the body of Christ. The same word that is translated mending is used in Ephesians 4 and 12. There it is translated perfecting. Amen. Sometimes the church needs mending. Amen. They were busy with edification. My God. You familiar with that word? No. Amen. It's to instruct and improve especially in moral and religious knowledge to uplift to enlighten to inform that's what these men were all about both of these ministries are desperately needed by the church Amen. the point is this <clears throat> the Lord designed and gifted each of us individually and for a specific purpose he will take us with our strengths and our weaknesses, and he will use us to do his work. Amen. Not all of us are gifted in the same way. But God has a job for each of us to do. The question is, are you doing what the Lord has equipped you to do? Where he has called you to do it, or are you trying to serve somewhere you shouldn't be? Come on now. Don't miss the fact that Jesus called men who were busy into his service. He did not go looking <clears throat> for lazy men to carry out his work. Now, I know we don't have to worry about that at this church. Far too many want the Lord to use them, and they sit and wait for him to come by. He has already placed you in his family. If you will just look around, did you look around? You will see that there is plenty of work you could be doing. He loves you, and he will show you what to do and where to do it. He doesn't leave you wondering. He's very specific about what he wants you to do. He was specific about what he wanted me to do. But just to be perfectly honest, I didn't want that. That's not how I envisioned my life. I didn't. And I look over here and there's the same number of men that Jesus encountered that moment. You see how he works? I needed an example. One, two, three, four. There they are. Can somebody please just say amen at least one time? One, two, three, four. And the thing about it is I love these men. The support that they give to me. They know I'm an old rookie. They know it. 
but they treat me with such kindness. And I love them for that. Thank you all. <clears throat> Luke 16 and 10 says, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. This event describes the second encounter these men have had with Jesus. The first time they met him, they were called to follow him in salvation. They are called into his service. <clears throat> Regardless of what this life leads you into, the most important thing in the world is having that first all-important meeting with the Lord Jesus Christ. If that doesn't take place, nothing else is going to matter. Did you, did you hear what I said? I'm just checking. <clears throat> Getting saved, however, is not the end of the road. After the Lord saves us, he wants us to move deeper yes, with him. Yes, he desires that we become disciples. Come on. Did you know that? Come on. Did you know that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. <clears throat> then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves yes, and yes, take up their cross yes, and follow me. Ephesians 2 and 10, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Regardless of the type of call that comes our way in life, whether it be for salvation, sanctification, or service, or separation, or surrender, that call needs to be heeded and never ignored. Right. His call is private. Right. When Jesus passed by that day, the real call was felt in the hearts of the four men who left all to follow him. Yes, no doubt their hearts were touched and they felt a strange power drawing them to go after Jesus. Yeah. But you notice that neither Zebedee, the servants, or any, of, or any of the other fishermen received the call that day. So it is with any call from God. No man knows what is happening in a person's heart until they make the fact of what God is doing public. His call is personal and private. It is between the Lord and the person with whom he is dealing. Evidently, the Lord had been dealing with the hearts of these men since they had first met him. That explains why they reacted instantly when he called them to follow him. I wonder what is the Lord saying to your heart today? Is he calling you to be saved? If you don't know the Lord, I hope that's why he's calling you. Is he calling you to some kind of Christian service? Is he calling you to leave all? And follow him? Can you imagine him telling you to just come and follow me? Don't worry about your family. Somebody will pick up the slack. Could you imagine that? Your wife is saying, hey, hey, what about the babies? I don't have a job. What about the income? What you going to do? I'm going to follow you. That don't, that don't sound plausible. That, that, it just, that wouldn't work with me. That wouldn't work with my wife. Hey, I can hear her now. Sometimes she calls me Carl. <laughs> Carl, where are you going? Where are you? Don't leave me. But these men, they left all. They left all. Isn't that amazing? I guess it's not amazing. Amen. Amen. His call is, is public. The Lord does his work privately, but he gets no glory until his will 
is worked out publicly. These men are called upon to make a public stand for Jesus. They are called upon to publicly line up with him, his preaching, and his program. Amen. Through the years, there have been a few servants of the Lord who tried to keep their love for him quiet. Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. Joseph's attempt at a private service did not last long. God did not save us and call us so that we could hide ourselves away and pretend that we're just like everyone else. That's not what he did. His call demands that we take our stand with him, regardless of what others may say about us. Today, far too many Christians are members of the Secret Service. You know what that means? Y'all know what the Secret Service means? It means your salvation is a secret from all your people, all your friends. Nobody knows you have a relationship with God. You're in the secret service. That don't count. That doesn't count. That don't count. You have to have an open relationship with your Lord and your Savior, Jesus Christ. Nothing else will do. Amen? Amen. We live in a world filled with people who could be headed to hell. They are trapped in darkness. They are lost and need help. One of the best ways we can help reach them is to live openly and honestly for the glory of God. We are called to be salt and light in the world. Our duty is to live a clean, holy, and public life for the glory of God. If the Lord has saved you and you have never made that fact known publicly, you need to do that today. This is a real good day for it, okay? If you have never followed him in that, do it today. You'll never get a better opportunity. If you've never followed him in believer's baptism, you need to make that step. If the Lord has called you to be on the job for him, the time to hide your light under a bushel is over. Now is the time to go to work for the Lord. John 9 and 4 said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no man can work. And I think about my own life when I read this. Because I think I was cutting it close. I really do. I've had, since I've gotten into this latter stage in the golden years, as they call it, I've had cancer. I've had a heart attack. What else have I had? Quadruple bypass, Uh-oh. stroke, Amen. just a few, just a few little, little, little issues. And as I stand here before you today, I just want you to know I feel pretty good. Amen. I feel pretty good. I might move a little bit slower, All right. but I feel pretty good. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you. That's precious to be able to tell you what I've been through, because I like to sneak my testimony in every chance I get. Amen. I need you to know what our Lord and Savior is capable of doing. Amen. And those of you that know me know I love to play golf. I had a doctor tell me, well, it's over. You won't be doing this no more. I said, why? I still got my clubs. <laughs> I got golf clubs everywhere. My wife, she get, she just, oof. I, pl- 
played yesterday. Amen. Finished second out of four. Amen. Young kids. That sounds like a mighty God we serve, don't it? Is this working? His call is precious. It's precious. These men were not what you would call the type that would be on, you know, History Channel or something really sophisticated. They were just kind of regular men. They were fishermen. That doesn't require a degree, does it? No. Ordinary. They were not especially wealthy. Just ordinary. Amen. They could afford to go to the corner market, get a loaf of bread, whatever. They were not among the movers and shakers of that society. Amen. Nothing really set them apart from the thousands of others who lived around the Sea of Galilee. Yet the Lord chose them and called them to be the first of his followers. That's special to me. What a privilege. They got a song, something about what a privilege. It's a privilege. And this is the way God has always been. He locates his finest treasures in the most obscure place. I can remember when he chose David. David had like seven brothers. It was eight of them. David was the youngest, smallest, but yet he was chosen by God. Same God chose Moses, who at the ripe old age of 80 was a murderer and a fugitive from justice. I think that's in Exodus. I don't have time to be reading. I can't. I'm just trying to. He chose Abraham from all the thousands of other men who lived in Ur of the Chaldees. It's in Genesis 12. Amen. And then this one, I just, I don't know what God was thinking. I don't know. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna give him a, the pass that I always give him. He chose Paul. He chose Paul to do all these things. Paul hated the church. He hated Christians. He hated Jesus. He hated Jesus. And Paul wrote is 40% of the, of the New Testament, whatever. You know, I, I had it figured out, but I lost it somewhere. But do you understand what I'm saying? And then I don't want to overlook any children because sometimes he decides he's going to use a child Amen. to do some things. Yes. But he once chose a small boy and he took the little boy's lunch. <laughs> and he fed a multitude of 5,000 people. Yes. Now that's the kind of God I'm talking to you about. Amen. Now if you still don't want to accept him today, then you just hold on to this negative stuff if you want to. But you're going to miss out on something really special. Amen. Come on. We're talking about the creator of all things, which includes the universe. Amen. When they start talking about the universe, they're talking about hundreds of millions of miles away. Oh, oh, I don't get that. You know, how do you even measure it? You know, but that's a mighty God. Mighty yes, sir. Mighty God. Part of why He did this, God has chosen. <laughs> 
the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. He, need, he, don't, he, don't, he don't owe us an explanation. He don't owe us nothing. He's already died for our sins and wiped our slate clean. The very fact that a person gets saved and then is allowed to serve the Lord is a privilege and a blessing beyond comparison. Yes, thank you, Jesus. After thank all, we deserve to be in, in a hot place. Yes, and I'm not talking about Bakersfield. <laughs> <laughs> this is what he does. Never take your salvation for granted. Amen. What he did when he called you and saved you is a thing more precious that the, than the mind can comprehend. Amen. If the Lord is calling you to come to Jesus for salvation, do not spurn his call. Amen. If he is calling you to, to a deeper level of service, do not hesitate. Yes, sir. But go full out for Jesus. Amen. His call is precious. Amen. There's no guarantee that you're going to make dinner today. You might drive out of here and you may not see the next stop line. Yes, sir. That's the way life is. Amen. Does anybody believe me? Yes. I'm an old guy. I've seen a lot of stuff. I hope that round of applause will leave. I believe you. His call is pricey. These men were called upon to make some real expensive choices. They were called upon to leave their friends, their family, their fortune, basically the only life they had ever known. They were expected to trade the certain for the uncertain, the visible for the invisible, the known for the unknown, their ability for their inability, the possible for the impossible. These men knew fishing inside and out, but they were helpless when it came to doing that which Jesus was calling them to do. His call was a call that would cost them everything. In the end, all but one would die for this man who was calling them to follow him. This call was a pricey call for every one of them, yet determined that the price was worth paying. The Bible says that they forsook their nets. That means they severed all ties with the nets. They walked off and left everything behind. Yeah. Jesus was worth more to them than anything they may have been walking away from. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Any answers? Anybody know? Zero? When the call of Jesus comes in your life <clears throat> and mine, we need to understand that often it will cost us plenty. Of course, his salvation is free and his power to serve is given to us freely by, by grace. But the cost of being saved and of selflessly serving the Lord is often a high price to pay. <clears throat> there will be those who will not understand it when you get saved. Amen. They will not understand the change in your life. They will not understand the desire to follow him. They will not understand the differences that Jesus makes in your life. They will not understand how you can give up everything to walk with him. It won't make sense to them. Yeah. They'll question you. And as a result, many will turn their backs on you and have nothing further to do with you. He would have us come to the place where we value him and his will more than anything else in this world. 
It will be only when Jesus becomes more precious to our hearts than family, friends, and fortunes that we will be able to give him the service he deserves. Amen. Sometimes <clears throat> what we're called to give, give up is nothing more than nets, yeah. tools. I like my tools, man. This is the last set they had in, at Sears, you know? But we're talking about tools. Sometimes what we are called to give up <clears throat> is nothing more than nets. At other times, we are called upon to walk out on things that are really precious to us. Amen. We have to come to the place where Jesus is more precious than anything in the world. Amen. If anyone ever tells you that serving the Lord is an easy road, they lie to you. There will be trials. There will be some self-sacrifice. There will be problems. There will be enemies. Even with all the difficulties that rear their ugly heads as we pass through this world, Jesus is worth it all. Is he calling you to be saved? Is he calling you to simply serve him? Let me encourage you to delay no longer. But to come to him and get busy for the Lord and for the glory of God. His call is so powerful. When the Lord's call came, these men left their nets and their profession without question. They did not call a committee meeting. They did not have a debate. They did not take any votes did not inquire about a contract or a length of service, how long you gonna keep me around. When Jesus called, these men left everything to follow him immediately. They stepped out of their boats, they stepped away from their lives, they followed Jesus, and they experienced a powerful change of life. Their lives were never the same again. When they left their nests, their boats, their incomes, their friends, and their families, they took on a new lifestyle of just doing what Jesus was doing. And the main thing Jesus was doing, he was walking a lot. Just walking. When they started out after Jesus, they began walking in his direction, to his destination, at his speed, and in his steps. And that's what serving Jesus is all about. When they walked away, they were never able to make a return to the old life. <clears throat> they tried, but they could not go all the way back. Jesus changed everything for these men. Their lives were never the same. In fact, Peter, James, and John were martyred for Jesus, and John was boiled in oil and exiled to Patmos. But John's life was spared before he was sent to the isle where he wrote the book of Revelation. When the call of Jesus comes to a life, whether it is for salvation or for service, it is a powerful call. Amen. When the Lord calls, he is not looking for a debate from you. He is looking for instant obedience. His call begins with it, a powerful change that takes place in the life of the one who follows him. This change is so great that a return to the old way of life is difficult to imagine. Therefore, this is 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away Behold, all things have become new. His call and our obedience to his call will result <clears throat> in our leaving our path to follow his path. In our walking in his direction to his destination at his speed and in his steps. It is so powerful that the person called wants to forsake everything that stands between us and our walking with him. There are those who have experienced the call of God to follow him. 
Still, they choose to hang on to the things of the world. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first, let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. His call is profound. All these men <clears throat> knew was the life of a fisherman. When Jesus called them to follow, he made them a promise that was framed in words they understood. He told them they would still be fishing, but from now on, they would be fishing for men. Instead of casting their nets into the Sea of Galilee, <clears throat> they would cast the gospel net into the Sea of Humanity. Instead of a literal net, they would use the word of God. Yeah. He, prom he promised to take them as they were and make them into what he wanted them to become. And that is exactly what he did. He changed each of these men and used them in powerful, profound ways for the glory of God. Jesus caused them to become what they had never been and what they had never intended to be. When his call comes, you can expect some changes to take place. I know when it comes to preaching the word of God, I just believe that when you're called to preach, I don't believe that, I'd say 99% of the, the preachers, I don't think that they really, really know what they're doing or what they're getting into when they begin. But the Holy Spirit works in the heart of the child of God and he prepares them for service to the master. The best thing you can do is to place the clay of your life into that hand of the heavenly potter. Place yourself at his disposal and watch out. He will use you. Yes. He will have you up all night. Yes, sir. That's not such a bad thing. After all, the greatest ability is availability. <clears throat> God will use you if you will make yourself available to him. When Jesus came walking by those boats that day, those four men were not wasting their time. Two were casting nets. This was important because if you do not cast a net, you will not catch any fish. And just like today, you've got to fish hard. If you want to catch fish, you've got to fish hard. You know what I'm saying? They were busy, but they were not doing anything of an eternal nature. In other words, they would have lived their lives, caught their fish, raised their families, died, and been forgotten if Jesus had not called them into a new life. <clears throat> when they followed Jesus, their lives instantly possessed eternal value. Yeah. God used them in ways that still impacts the world today. That is what he does to every life. Amen. He touches. Yeah. He takes us away from the mundane and the shallow and places us in a position where we can be a part of something that will last forever. As I close, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. In which world are you laying up your treasures? Do you know? Would you like to live a life of eternal significance? Amen. Is Jesus calling you to come to him today for salvation? for sanctification, for service? What will you do with his call? This altar is open right now. 
Just as he passed by those boats by the Sea of Galilee that morning, he is passing by your heart right now. I know he is speaking to someone right now. If he is calling you, the time to come to him is when? Right now. Will you respond to the Lord's call? Will you come to Jesus? The doors of the church are open. To God be the glory. Thank you. Family Community Church of Fresno is empowering millions of people around the world through dynamic preaching and teaching, humanitarian aid, and many other ministry efforts. For additional information and resources from Family Community Church, please visit www.familycommunitychurch.com or call 559-323-5002. We love you and look forward to serving you in the kingdom.